Thank you for that reading, Jacob. <clears throat> We're going to be right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to walk through this text this morning. And thankful to have visitors with us today. Thankful for the opportunity to come here to be together. And to begin, I want to ask you a question. When I use the word church, what comes to your mind? Oftentimes, when we think of church, we may use an accommodative phrase like going to church, right? I mean, you might have even said that today, right? And then when you think about that concept, usually church in that context is an action or it's a routine. It's like going to a baseball game or it's like going to a concert when we use that type of description. Or maybe you were driving past the building and you said, there's the church, or I'm going up to the church, right? And so in that case, the way we're using the word in our vocabulary is we're talking about a place. We're talking about a location. But what I want us to think about is how Paul used the word. So when Paul uses the word here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, and he says to the church of God, which is at Corinth, or in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, where he says that God gave him as head over all things to the church, is that what he meant? Is that what he means by the use of this particular word? Was it an action? Was it a location? Now let me suggest that that is not the case, because if you go through and you fill in the rest of these phrases, you will have to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. That's very different than a location or an action. That's to a group of people. That's like writing to a family. You wouldn't write to the house that is at 4808 Lone Hill, right? You're writing to the people that live there in that particular place. And then think about this description as well. He goes on to say, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The reason this is important is because what we end up with is not an action that we participate in or a location that we go to, but rather a community that we belong to. And that makes all the difference in the world. Because what we have in our minds, and even by the way we use our words, we reinforce messages or we communicate perhaps misunderstandings. Because sometimes, you ever know, whenever you think about uh, what Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And the way that we speak and the words that we use sometimes can have a bit of a misunderstanding or at least reinforce a misunderstanding of the nature of the church regarding it being a network or an object or an action that a person participates in, like going to play at a softball field with the ball team or something along that line, instead of a community. Because in a community, it's a group, it's a family that has a name, that has life that they are spending together. There's meaning that is shared within that. There's relationships, and particularly there's an identity that is part of being in that group. Now, the way this practically works out is really important for our, our community and our world. Because a lot of times people think of the church as a commodity. So it's something that you can either have or not have. You can choose to be a part of it or to not be a part of it. And then they view it perhaps as a service, kind of like Netflix or uh, you know, Hulu or something like that, to where if it doesn't meet your expectations, you, you, know, you fire off an angry email to somebody somewhere and it goes off to somebody someplace. And so they complain about it. And then if you're really upset with your subscription, what do you do? You just unsubscribe. You go to somebody else. And so they go to a different group that better serves their needs. And so this modern consumer-driven viewpoint of the church is very present today. And the issue really, though, of all the different things that we would look at and we'd say that there's a problem with that, the issue ultimately is a matter of identity. Identity is the most important concept. It is the way that we use our words. It's how you think about yourself, how I think about myself, and how we think our, about ourselves collectively. That's the main issue, is about identity. And so the church today is suffering from an identity crisis of sorts. 
because we're thinking about it as an action or a location or a network that I can choose to be a part of. And so this book, though, 1 Corinthians, is largely about that issue. Have you noticed how many times in this book he has mentioned that you are something? You are the temple of God. You are God's field. You are, as we'll talk about today, the body of Christ. Why does he keep saying that? Because he's telling individuals who they are. He's telling the community who they are because he is reshaping their identity. And so the reason that that's so important is because identity drives everything. When you're a parent, how do you motivate your children? Many times you may say to them, that is not how Millards act. What are you doing with them? You are reinforcing their identity. If you say to them, we don't act like that because it's how animals act, you are made in the image of God. What are you doing? You're reinforcing identity to them. Identity is absolutely critical. And so when you look at the statement here in chapter 12 and verse 27, he gives an amazing statement of identity when he says, Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. So what I want to do with our time this morning is just ask a few questions to tease that out. Basically, what does it mean that I'm a member of the body? Where do divisions come from? And then how does the message of the cross shape us into the body of Christ? And then we'll make a little bit of application there at the end. So let's go ahead and begin as we talk about the body of Christ. And here in this chapter, as we think about this first question, what does it mean that I am a member of the body? Notice that this text is often it uses the word members a lot. And so when we think about members, though, we think maybe members at the Lion Club, Lions Club or something like that. But Paul introduced this back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you remember, he was talking about sexual morality. He said the reason that sexual morality is a problem is because of who you are. You are members of Christ. And so he uses that same concept over and over again here. But he doesn't say it's like Lions Club. He said it's like your body. It's like you have an eye or an ear or a hand or a foot or something like that. Now, why is Paul using this? Why is Paul using this particular illustration? Well, as I said, it's a, first off, it's about identity. See, the church of Corinth had an upside down view about themselves and about the nature of who they were as a church. They did not see themselves as an interconnected whole or a body like Paul is describing. They're thinking about themselves and perhaps maybe in subgroups or individuals, but they're not thinking about them as a community, as an interconnected whole. And so when you think about them and what he's describing here is he is saying to a certain extent, you are no longer individuals. You're no longer individuals. You can't be. I mean, the hand by itself is nothing. So you are no longer individuals. In fact, there in verses 12 and 13, an important text, he says that even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, where the Jews are Greeks, where the slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. See, what Paul was saying is that they are now in something. They've experienced something by the Spirit, and they're now in that body. But think about how transformational it is. And do you know how it reshaped the identity? Look at what he says. It doesn't matter if you are slave or free. It doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Greek. This is more important than your cultural identity, your status in society, your financial status. All of those things are irrelevant compared to the fact that you are in the body of Christ. Now, Paul is also tying this concept together to the concept of these grace gifts, or these gifts that come from God. Now, as he writes to Corinth, this is actually a church that for all the problems in it, they didn't have any problems with spiritual gifts in the sense of the amount. If you remember back at chapter 1 and verse 7, he said that they lack no spiritual gift. He's not like the Romans where he wants to come and give it to them. They already have it there. And so he's going to explain the nature of those gifts and how those gifts are inseparably connected to the fact that they are part of the body 
and that each person is expected to use that gift in the context and for the benefit of the body. Now, you'll quickly notice a few, a few things that jump out here in this text regarding these gifts. So let's talk a little bit about those. I uh, appreciate Jacob's reading on that. There's all kinds of different mentions of just these one-liners, one-words for all these different things here. But the first thing that you would notice is that a lot of these fit in a supernatural category. Wouldn't you agree? You've got things like miracles and prophecy and tongues, things like that. And those are unique manifestations of the Spirit. And, you know, I wanted to spend more time on this, but just for sake of time today, I'm not going to get into everything on this. But these were things that were given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. If you go to Acts chapter 8, you see what Simon wanted to buy. He wanted to buy that particular ability to pass on the Holy Spirit. But the thing I also want you to notice is that there are a lot of these that are not supernatural. If you look at administrations, for example, I will say for me, that's almost a supernatural gift because I'm just not very good at the administrations thing. There's other people that have that. But then when you think about helps and teachers, and then outside of this context, when you talk about tongues or interpretations of tongues, those aren't going to be miraculous normally. But are they still a gift? They are definitely a gift. There's something that is given by God. However, notice again here in verses 4 through 6 what he says. Did you notice three times he goes through and he says, this is the New American Standard. He says that there's a variety of gifts, there's a variety of ministries, and a variety of effects or powers. And so one of the things about this is that there is this exploding diversity that is here that is actually something that is the strength of the body. Just like when you look out in nature, is it good that we just have one kind of tree everywhere? No, it's the diversity that gives the strength among people. And in many different ways, diversity is actually an important thing. And yet, quite obvious through this entire text, the reason that he's writing this is to tell them that everyone there has a gift. And it fits into one of these categories. And he says there in verse 7 that these are a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, the reason that that's important is because these are not something that you earned. This is not something that you just said, hey, I've been here. I've got, I was talking about tenure with, uh, with Josh a little bit this week. I've got tenure. I've been here 10 years. I've got this gift. I've earned it. I put in my time. That's not what he's saying. These are gifts that come freely by the grace of God and are given to believers. And that's important. So when we think about what does it mean to be a member here. What does it mean that I am a member? Well, think about what this text is saying to you and to me. First off, it is saying that I have an enormous gift. I've been given an identity that's more important than my family, my ethnic background, my financial status. I am a member of the body of Christ. I have been made to drink of God's spirit. I am part of the community that God has purchased with the precious blood of his son. That is the most important identity that you should have in your heart. And further, it's not something that you have individually. It's something that we all have. And so that is a revolutionary and a fantastic identity. So you can always walk with, with pride. Obviously, we're talking about the humility and pride. But you can be proud of what God has done for you. You can be thankful for what God has done. But further, think about what this text is saying as well. It is saying that every one of us has been given a gift. In this context, a service or an activity or something like that, that you actually have the privilege of. You have the privilege of offering that as a benefit to the local community. So what does that mean then? That means I have work to do. I have a role to play. I have a part here. I have a job to do. And so again, the church is not an activity or an action that I participate in or a location that I go to, but a community and a relationship that I belong in and I serve in, just like in a family. Just like in a family. And so whether we are apostles or teachers or prophets or if we have any of the gifts mentioned here, they're all blessings that come from God's grace and they represent new positions and services that I then lend or give to the service of Christ for His glory. Now, that high and precious calling and identity are critical to understand. Because if the community needs something, like the North Hickson Church needs something, who takes care of that? 
You know, I remember having this conversation. I think it was Jeremy Bailey that uh, I heard it. I didn't hear it from him. I heard it through Byron. So there you go. But about how there's no magical little fairies that run around and make this place work. That's not how it works. If something is done here, it is because the community has done something here. That's just how, that's how it, it always works, just like in the family. The family doesn't do anything unless someone in the family did something. And so that is very important to understand. And so if the community needs the community has to provide it. That's you and me. So that's what it means to be a member of the body. But what is it, what causes the division within the body. Because when we start, you know, if we ended it right there, we might say, wow, that sounds great. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a wonderful place to be. Everything is, is nice and happy and everything's fine. But any reasonable person that spent any time in a local church realizes that despite having the wonderful blessings of this identity and wonderful gifts that can be used in the service of God, there are issues. There's hiccups that come up. And perhaps we would use the word that Paul used here, divisions. So how did that work out in Corinth? Well, it's interesting when you talk about diversity. Diversity is one of the things that's seen as a strength, and yet if the body doesn't have the right attitude or the right goal, the thing that is their strength becomes their downfall. When people begin focusing on each other and focusing on themselves and how they're different, they start now turning on the body. It is just like if you've had anybody that's had cancer or an immunity issue or something like that, what's going on in that person's body? It is that body is attacking its own body, right? Just like our natural bodies can become unhealthy and attack themselves, that's what can happen in the body of Christ. Now, Paul, is con Paul continues with this idea of the body, and he illustrates the absurdity of this. And part of the things that makes this text a challenge is that we've talked about it so many times. I don't want to tell you all the things that you already know here. But one of the things that is really, really powerful here is he talks about the relationship of the members themselves. In verses 15 and 16, you have the first group that is comparing themselves to other people, and what do they say? The foot says to the hand, Basically, I'm not a hand. And what's the conclusion that they make themselves? Well, I'm not doing what the hand does, so I'm not a part of the body. And he gives a couple of examples of that. And then you have a second group that is again comparing themselves to the other. In this case, it's the eye to the hand. And they have a superiority. If you compare the other one, it's more inferiority. But they have a superiority complex. And in shocking arrogance, they say, I don't even need you. And so Paul is pointing out that the very diversity that is a gift of God has now become an issue. Not because of something that God has messed up in the programming, but because something has been taken out. The focus has been taken out. Because as he says down here in verse 25, that the reason God did this and he ordered it this way was so that the body would have no division and that they would care for one another. And yet, tragically, it has become the source of division, and if it's left unchecked in a local church, it will destroy it. It will destroy it. So what does this look like then in a local body? Let me give you an example of something that we've already talked about. This is great for people that are coming in like 10 chapters into our study already. Let's go back to chapter 1 and verse 10 for just a second. If you remember, we had an example of how this worked already within the book. In chapter 1 and verse 10, he mentioned that he heard about divisions there in the local church. And what was it about? It was about the preachers that they had there. You had Paul and Apollos and Peter. And the first four chapters of this book are primarily teasing out some of the divisions that they had according to various people. And so as we continue through the book, in chapter 3, what Paul says is he elaborates on his relationship with the church. He said that he was the founder of the church at Corinth. Another illustration was that he was the first one to plant the seed and that Apollos and others came back and watered it. So Apollos is the one that builds on the foundation. He's the one that waters. Paul's the one that planted the seed and laid the foundation. Now, let me illustrate the absurdity of what Paul is talking about in chapter 12 in the context of Paul and Apollos for a second. 
Imagine Paul looking at Apollos and saying, Wow, man, I, I really can't preach like Apollos. I better just hang it up. I'm done. I think all of us would say, that's absolutely absurd. And yet that's the picture that he says here. When one member looks at another and says, I don't do what they do, therefore I'm not going to do anything, I can't offer anything, that's the same type of picture. Now think about it from the other side. Imagine Apollos comes up to Paul and say, oh, that's all right, Paul. You really can't preach as well as I do. You know what? We'd probably be a better church if you weren't here. That's absurd, isn't it? And yet that's exactly what Paul was saying. It's as absurd as your eye saying to your hand, I don't need you, or your foot saying, because I'm not a hand, I don't have anything to offer. So how does this happen? How does this happen? That's what's so curious to me. What's causing this behavior? Let me suggest that the answer to that is that the focus has been taken off of God and it has been put on man. Do you notice what all of these members are doing in chapter 12? Who are they looking at? Does it say they're looking at Christ? It's that they're comparing themselves to each other. So when we think about that issue, what's the problem with that? What's the problem? Well, think about what Corinth was having an issue with. What are they focused on? Peter, and, you know, Peter, Paul, Apollos. They're focused on themselves. They're focused on what they want. And so Paul is showing that every single person has to be focused on the right thing. And if they're not focused on the right thing, they start focusing on the wrong thing, then we have an issue. Now turn to chapter 4 there. If you remember, Paul actually goes back and he says, all right, you saw how Paul and Apollos operated. They never said that kind of thing to each other. They worked great together, even though they were very, very different, had different skills and benefits. And if you remember his conclusion of that section in the first three chapters, he says in verse 6, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that you all, we might also might reign with you. Now, look at what this text is saying. He's saying... I've applied this to Paul and to myself and Apollo, so you would see how you're supposed to work together. And he says, so that you may learn in us not to exceed what is written. Now, what are you talking about, Paul, when you say about written? If you remember, he said, it's about not boasting in men. Not boasting in yourself and thinking about yourself. And what's the response then in verse 6? It's so that none of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. As you think about what he's describing there in verse 8, you got people, I'm better, I'm more superior, you're inferior. There's this complete contrast of how they view it. And yet he says there at the end of verse 8, why are you boasting about this? It's not like you earned it. It's not like you achieved it yourself. It's something that was given to you by God. Now, this is what happens when problems come into a local church. And I will tell you, it is almost every single time this particular issue. It starts with people who compare themselves to others and say, I don't really have anything to offer. I'm not part of the body. They look at the preachers or the elders or older members and they may say, I'll just never be like them. I can't do what they do. But it also happens when you have leaders and other members in a local church and they say, as they look at other people in the church, that, wow, you know, <laughs> those guys, man, they're the anchor. They're dragging this ship down. If we didn't have them, we'd be doing a whole lot better. And I will say to my shame that I have been in that type of attitude myself. And I think if you're honest, you probably fit in that category at some point as well. It's a terrible thing. 
And yet these happen all the time, don't they? It is not uncommon for preachers and elders to then think, well, you know, all we need in the church is, you know, good teaching and all that kind of thing. And then they're not thinking about the person that fixed the plumbing or the person that wrote the cards or visited the sick or cooked the meal. And the thing I want us to understand is whenever this nonsense starts, it will absolutely destroy the body. And so what is the reason, though? What's the reason for this? It is being enamored with self. It's self, 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 every part of it. See, those ones with false humility that go through and say, I really don't have anything that I can offer, who are they looking at? Themselves and other people. They are thinking about themselves so much, instead of thinking about, there's a person that I can help. There's something that I can do. I mean, Jesus isn't one to overlook small offerings. I mean, he said, if you offer a cup of water in my name, you're not going to lose your reward. And then the ones that are arrogant, again, they're thinking about themselves. What makes them feel better about themselves? How they're superior and more valuable? And instead of realizing that they will be nothing apart. It'd be great to come up here and prepare a wonderful sermon, but I will say this. If you weren't here, it'd be a whole lot less interesting. <laughs> it's just how it works. It's a community. It's a body, right? Now, think about this, this question, and I think this is absolutely critical for this section. How does the message of the cross shape us into Christ's body? Remember what he started this book with. He talked about the message of the cross. And for those that haven't been here, we've been referring back to Mark chapter 8, where Jesus told them to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And about what that message meant of imitating him and of, of sacrificing themselves. And so as you think about what he's doing, he is taking the gospel and again, reshaping their identity. Now, what I want to end with is this staggering statement back in chapter 12. Back in chapter 12. So when I mean the message of the cross, hopefully you're with me now. <laughs> and then now we see the goal of what the gospel shapes them toward. It's really easy to read past this. I'll say this in my own study this week. I mean, I've read this text I don't know how many times, but I never really appreciated what he said here in verse 26. He says, <clears throat> actually, let's begin in verse 25. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, <laughs> I think if I was writing this, we'd say some of the members rejoice with it. Some of the members mourn with them, right? But if you really slow down and look at that, that's a really, really high bar. All, 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 it's all through that. Now, we know this is true in an actual body. How many of you have been out there in the shop and you hit your finger with a hammer? The whole body <laughs> is, is jumping in saying, ouch, that really, really hurt. It's not a life-threatening thing, but okay, one thing there. But think about this. Have you ever had a compliment on your hair? I don't have many of those these days, but... <laughs> All it takes for a woman, though, for the whole body to be excited and to rejoice for the entire day is, your hair looks great today. One little member, right? And the whole body rejoiced with it. One little member and the whole body mourned or suffered with it. So then what is the solution to this problem? How do we get to that? Because I've, I've been a part of a lot of different churches, but to get to that level where one little the finger got hit and everybody's like, you okay? <laughs> and then one thing happened and everyone's like, that's great. I don't think I've ever seen that. So how do we get there? Well, the message of the cross is important because in the message of the cross, what I think we'll see is it will crush the pride that creeps into churches. At the same time, though, it will radically encourage us to use all of our gifts for God's glory and to build up the body. Okay, so let's talk about how that works. He gives the answer right here in verse 31. He says, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. And I show, and I show you still a more excellent way. Probably 
you know what the next thing is. It's love, right? It's love. There's actually two ideas here. The first is in verse 31, the first part of it, and then the second one. The first thing that is so important is to understand that everything is a gift. Everything is a gift. Now, you may think, why is that so important? But if it's a gift, that means you didn't earn it. And you're not in this body because you paid a membership and you reached a certain status. You were given something that you could not earn. And so, depending on the gift, whatever it is in this particular concept, context, you couldn't earn it. In fact, that's what Paul said back in chapter 4 and verse 7. Why are you boasting as if you, as if you didn't receive this? You're boasting about something that was a gift to you. See, gifts by themselves exclude boasting. So what is he saying is the first thing that is so important to shape us into Christ's body? It is grace. And too often when I've looked at local churches that aren't acting like this, guess what is missing in their pulpits and in their churches? It's grace. The issue with Corinth is that they were missing an appreciation of the grace of God. And what they were focused on was their self-righteousness. And what I mean by self-righteousness is not that they are righteous, is that they think they're righteous and they think they're okay. And further, they did the things that made them feel superior to others. Grace is the first thing that is needed. The second is, again, that more excellent way. It's love. Now, why do you give those amazing and free gifts? It's because of love. And what was the greatest gift that was ever given? It was Christ. So what is missing in Corinth? Not only is grace missing, love is missing. If you remember what he said back in chapter 8 and verse 1, he said, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And that is the true mark of maturity. Not that you've got a great skill, that you speak in tongues, that you know all of these different things. It is that you truly love. That's the mark of maturity. And so if they had those things in their mind, the interesting thing is it would stop their feelings of worthlessness and stop their feelings of superiority. Now, how does that happen? <laughs> well, in the first case, think about what grace means. <clears throat> grace means you need something. And if you don't have it, then you're in real trouble. And in our case, it's to an even greater extent. Think about where we would be without the grace of God. We would be on the path to hell, brethren, because of our sins. And in eternity there. But, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, but God, <laughs> but God, in His grace, He gave a gift. And that grace of God was revealed Spirit in the message of the cross, in the fact that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, what I have to do is I have to take that truth, and I've got to let it get way, 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 way down in my mind and in my heart. Because inevitably, what I do periodically is I do a lot of right things, and I think I'm a great person because of that. When the truth is, no one is righteous, no, not one. And so the message of grace needs to sink into my heart because that is what will humble me. Because grace says, you need something. You need God. And when I accept Him by grace through faith, I am saying, I need you. I am completely dependent. Superiority and inferiority vanish here. At least part of it does. Because almost always, where do the strong and weak divisions come at in a local church? That person obeys really well over there. That person doesn't obey really well. Look at me, I'm great and they're not. But yet in the message of the cross, what does it say? There is an unrighteous, no, not one. We are all saved by grace through faith. Everyone has the exact same need of the Savior. You ever heard the saying, the ground is level at the cross? That was important for Corinth, but it is important for us to remember as well. We are all saved by grace. But now the second case is love, and this will also work on these, these division concepts that happen and the inferiority and superiority. 
What is the reason that God gave us His grace? John says in John 3.16, that it is because He loved us. That's the reason. It's because He loved us. And so we have to let that sink down in our hearts as well. Do you really think that you're loved? Do I really think that? To the extent that I understand how much God loves me, that will change everything. Oftentimes, we just have not let that sink down very far into our minds. We intellectually know it. We know that God died for the whole world. But the fact that God would die for you, and He would die for me, that's kind of a, whoa, I haven't really let it sink in to that level. And yet, what does that mean then? How does that reshape this weak, strong dynamic? Let me first off say what it says to the weak. It says to the weak, you're valuable. You're worthwhile. You matter to God. In fact, you matter so much to God, He was willing to die for you. There are people in this audience that need to be radically affirmed that somebody loves them, that somebody cares about them, that they're accepted, that everything's okay, and that they will always be there, and they will never be let down. That's the message of the cross. And to the weak person that is so needy and doesn't think anything about how valuable they are, the message of the cross says you are absolutely valuable. But then, interestingly, it says to the strong the same thing, but it does kind of a different thing. Because to the strong, what it says is, you don't have to prove yourself anymore. You don't have to prove yourself by putting other people down which is how we deal with kind of this inferiority. We go one way or the other. It's that you are loved and accepted right now. I am everything you need. I am your satisfaction. You don't have to earn it. It's a gift that I give to you. And that's why it's so important to understand what the gospel is. It is not we we work and work and work and work and then God saves us. It is that God saves us. And then we work and we work and we work and we live in light of that truth. See, what was really falling apart in the church at Corinth is they did not have the humility and the love that are at the core of the message of the cross. At some point, they just did not understand how much God loved them. And as a result of that, they don't really love God like they should. And further, they don't love each other like they should either. That's what this love is all about. And that's why in chapter 13, we'll go into that next week, that's why this is right at the heart of this entire book. Now the thing is, when we get these things into our hearts, we can actually do what verses 25 and verses 26 say. Because now I can look at people that are inferior, as I might view them in the flesh, (laughs) that have flaws, and I say, look, I'm inferior And God accepted me by grace, and I'll accept you by grace. And I'm not going to love them because they're so great and because they deserve it. Because God loved me when I did not deserve it. And I will love them when they do not deserve it either. All of these things come in to where now these people, they suffer with one another, and they're honored, and they rejoice with one another. And see, the reason that this is so important, this is what the gospel does, is it shapes and makes a community. And when people really experience the message of the cross, what it will do is it will change from a network that you just go to and you just worship together with, or a place that you go to to check your box or whatever. You will change from those kinds of things into a living and breathing body of Christ that explodes with new life and joy and grace and love and service as you go through and fulfill the needs of the members around you and accomplish God's will in the world. That's what he's talking about here. And so what that means is we have to get our eyes off of ourselves. We have to get our eyes off of each other's faults and instead focus on the fact that Jesus' perfect righteousness has been given to you and to me and for the whole world if they will accept it. And that in Christ we are beautiful and loved, that we are maturing into His image, 
and that we have a valuable service to God, and we are loved to an infinite degree. That's what it means to be the body. And that's what it means that God put us in that body. Now, let's talk about how these things kind of uh, change some things, and then we'll talk briefly about application. The first thing is, this changes my focus. I start looking around, instead of at me, or comparing myself to other people in regards to gift, gifts, now I look at those people that are hurting and broken. And I go out from a mutual place of brokenness, but also joy, and say, how can I help you? How can I serve you? I'm not better than you. I'm not less than you. I'm trying to help you just like I have been helped. The focus is different. It also changes the methods. Because how did Jesus go about trying to get people to change and to bring them? Did he just go through and wave his big, uh, his big staff and say, look, all of you bow? No. He served in weakness and suffering so that others could be healed at his own expense. See, he's now a model, an example of what I do for other people. He didn't come in strength and superiority. He came in brokenness, weakness, and compassion. And he knew something that all of us need to realize, that even if we die, <laughs> amazing things can be accomplished because of that. But then it also again changes my identity. Because now, guess what? You can get off the treadmill of self-righteousness. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to constantly work and work and work and try to just go through and say, oh, maybe if I do all these things, God will be pleased with me. He's not pleased with you because of what you did. He's pleased because of what Christ did. But then I am radically empowered then. All that energy I spent on trying to be better than other people <laughs> can now go to good use to go and to be Christ's hands and feet. Isn't that what it means to be the body? If He is the head, then I am the body. I can now go and serve. I can share the gospel and help heal the brokenness and suffering in the world. Now, let's talk briefly about application and then the lesson will be yours. <clears throat> How do we make these changes today? Let me give you just three simple things. So hopefully I've given you the overall picture, but maybe some specifics will be helpful. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to consider one another and give thanks for each other. I want you to look at the people to your left and to your right for a minute. <laughs> this is your community, right? If you're a member here, if you're not, you may be somewhere else, but you're, you're part of a greater community. Now, I want you to think about how blessed you are to have the people that are right around you. And then think about what they do for the body and give thanks for them. Okay? Now, I want you to also go home and look at the church directory, or you can get it on the website, and start in the beginning and pray for every single person that is part of this local community and each family. And then what I want you to do is make sure you're especially, especially aware, especially on those ones that you may have a disagreement with, you may have... You know, some that person's challenging to love or whatever the case is. But look at them and here's some words for you. Say, all right, I'm sorry. <laughs> Realize, I guess, take these words away. Do not say, I have no need of you. But say, I need you. I need you. Now, the second thing is, I want you to start gossiping, not in the, not in the wrong way. But it's time we talked behind each other's back in the concept of honoring and speaking well of one another. I don't know how it is in your marriage. I love when my wife speaks well of me, and I think she loves when I speak well of her. And that's something that can be missing in local churches, especially when there's division, is we don't talk well about each other. We don't praise each other. It's especially important in a marriage, which, by the way, Parenthetically, that's another one of the body concepts to becoming one. You learn about the body concept in marriage, so you can understand part of it when you come to the church. Start speaking well about your brother. This is a great church. We're not perfect by any stretch. I'm not perfect either. But this is a great church, and we love each other. 
But yet we've got to keep growing in that. And then the third thing is connect with one another in doing good. You know, I don't know how you feel about churches. I feel like churches and members have been programmed to death. Here's another program. Here's another program. Here's another program. Okay. There's a lot to do here. And just as the hand needs the eye to guide it, what you've got to do is combine with people to do the various things here. And I don't mean let's set up some programs where the body operates like the body. If people understand who they are and they understand the relationship that they have to one another, guess what will happen? He doesn't say go be the body. He says you are the body. It will naturally happen. But let's see how that might work out here. Find someone that has a complementary gift. I'll give you, I talked about this a little bit with Byron. You know, Byron and I, we're really similar, but we're also really different. We found that out, I guess, over the last couple of weeks. There's been a lot of times we seem really similar. Byron is this kind of plotter and planner and strategizer. I am not. But what I am, I will give you like a thousand ideas. You give me like, hey, how do we take, you know, take care of this problem? Here's 12 ways that we can take care of that problem. And Byron will say, 10 of those stink. <laughs> These two are great. Let's march forward. Okay. And one of the things that is great is that Byron and I are very, very different. We're separated by nearly 30 years. And he's gone from a technical field and preaching and all that kind of thing. But we can combine to do more than we could on our own. And that's just one example that there are many people here. Bill talked about this last week. Bill loves to teach Bible studies. He's really good at it. Bill may have trouble having the com communication trying to set the study, but some of you are great at inviting people to your house and cooking an amazing pot roast and saying, hey, meet Bill, <laughs> and it'd be great to have you over. That's hurt that this is really good, and this is really good, and through your strengths, you become stronger, and you do something that you couldn't do on your own. And in that process, you hide your weaknesses. And see, there are many things in this body that I'm extremely proud of. And these are things that I could not do on my own. I just think about the situation with, with Gene Hale, losing his wife and losing his daughter and how awful that is. We have a lovely sister, Norma, who was there in his time of need and was there helping Peggy and was there when she pa right after she passed. And Byron, he had freedom of schedule as well, ran over there and helped and was there. That wasn't a program, guys. That's the body. That's the body doing what they're supposed to do. And further, there are many things that I think about with our, 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 uh, our buildings here. I mean, I may not be great at painting lines out there and of patching you know, sidewalk and all that kind of thing, but where would we be without Pete Gebhardt and David Rankin? And I'll tell you what, one of the things I'm great about is I've not had to mess with the slide today. I mess with the live stream, and that's because we've got great people like Jeremy Porch and Jeremy Bailey that do a great job. And yet oftentimes we complain, and it's so frustrating. <laughs> but if we work together as a body to say, I'm great at this, and you're great at this, let's work together, and let's hide that weakness that you may have. And let's become stronger because of it. That's what we're talking about here. And there are many examples that I could give, but that's just a few of them. But what I want to end with is the great tragedy. It's interesting to me that this discussion is right after what was discussed last week, that I appreciate Byron very much, regarding the Lord's Supper. And what I want you to see is that the Lord's Supper is actually at the, at the heart of the solution here. Remember, they had not properly discerned the body. And oftentimes when we think about the body, we think about the body of Jesus. But the body is used in two senses here. And so, yes, the first process is that they had not fully appreciated what Christ had done to condemn their sin and to make them the righteousness of God. They needed to remember that. But further, the other way they were not discerning the body was because they had forgot about the wonderful people that they now share community with. That's what this is about. It's not just discerning one part of the body, it's about discerning all of us together. And so the answer then is to go back to the table. We've got to go back to this table and remember the message of the cross. 
And parenthetically here, let me just say this as a means to, if you have questions or want to talk about this more, what we're talking about with the body is for those that are a part of the body. And remember how we became a part of that was through baptism. He said there in verses 12 and 13. So what we do here, we come together as those that have participated in that, been baptized into Christ, we remember what He did and we remember one another. Because then that radically affirms us and radically humbles us as we remember the great death of Christ and the wonderful blessing we have now to be part of His body and to serve one another. Would you pray with me? Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all that you give to us. We're thankful for the new identity, the new name that you've given to us. That we are so much more now in your Son than we were before. And that you have grace and mercy to shape us into your image so that we can be like your Son. Father, please help us to be the body that you want us to be. Help us to put away the divisions and the struggles and the stresses and help us to focus on you and to remember that you are the goal, you are the pattern. And to turn away from looking down on each other because of our weaknesses or thinking we are inferior by comparing our strengths. Help us to realize our value, that we are not greater, but we are not less than anyone else, and that we are all valuable to you. We've all been purchased by the, by the precious blood of your Son. Help us to remember that as we partake of the the Lord's Supper this morning. Help us to discern the body and to remember the great gift that we have and how we now share in that because of the death of your Son. In your Son's precious name, amen.